everybody, this is John for MTG Nexus coming at you with an old video, but I think it's still relevant toward the content that was created in it. This is the burn perspective of Burn versus Heliod Company. This was the companion video to the Heliod Company versus Burn video that I made, uh, I think back in December, but I don't think either deck has really changed all that much to affect the outcome of the games that were played for this recording. Um, taking a look at things from the Burn perspective this time, last time we take a, took a look from things from the Heliod Company perspective. Taking a look at what cards are meaningful for Burn, both in the main deck and in the sideboards. As you may see, this is a list that's a little bit different than the one I've been playing a lot of recently in Leagues. But, you know, a lot of the cards are the same. You still have the same core of Goblin Guide. Basically, you still have the same core of... Uh, these cards that I'm constantly talking about as the core of almost every burn deck. Um, these are kind of the 24 that don't really change. You know, some of the finer details, like the numbers of Sunbit Canyons, Fire Islets, those change. This package of spells change. Sometimes you run less than four Rift Bolt. Sometimes you run four less, less than four Skewer. Sometimes you run more Skull Cracks than less. You know, in this matchup, uh, the key of the flex cards are mainly Skull Crack and Searing Blaze. Skull Crack to prevent the life gain. Searing Blaze to deal with creatures. Um, Lightning Helix isn't quite as relevant, although being able to target creatures and gain a little bit of life in some awkward racing situations can be important. A lot of times it's just about them establishing the combo or getting too much life for Burn to handle it. And then keeping their board under control. Sometimes it's possible, sometimes it's not. They are a collected company deck. Sometimes collected company and tribal decks can just get out of hand. And as a burn player, you just have to turn your burn spells at that point and try to kill your opponent. Not easy against a deck packing Oriok Champion, Heliod, uh, Spike Feeder, Conclave Mentor. You know, basically life gain dot deck that isn't Soul Sisters. So the, the deck we're playing against is kind of the spiritual successor to the old... Uh, Kitchen Finks, uh, Viscera Seer combo, which then became the successor of, or was the predecessor to the Devoted Druid combo. Basically, the green white X combo deck of the format right now. Heliod is the one that's proven the best right now. Uh, Devoted Druid hasn't been seen play a ton in some time, but you know, they are all trying to execute some type of infinite combo. Um, this one happens to be particularly annoying for Burn because, well, infinite life can be basically can't be overcome by a deck that does finite amount of damage. As far as the sideboard, key cards to look out for are anything that deals with creatures, so Path to Exile, Searing Blood, Searing Blaze, uh, any additional copies of Skull Crack, and then additional copies of Rolling Vortex. Uh, Rolling Vortex is both a very strong card and a very weak card in this matchup at the same time. Um, it's strong in terms of preventing their life gain, um, but it does often require you to take a turn off which sometimes if your opponent has a Heliod in play or casts a Collected Company at the end of turn that you cast this spell, can become quite problematic, kind of kind of the shields down for a turn, um, especially if you're playing on turn two. Sometimes turn three you can hold up mana, you know, representing Bolt or, you know, the, com uh, the activation itself. So a lot of different things can go on there, but, and also your opponent does often have some number of Skyclave Apparitions to answer it, so, you know. Looking at that, there are a number of ways the Heliod deck can answer it, but it's still a very important card as just a static way to keep your opponent from uh, gaining life as long as you have mana open. And then Deflecting Palm can come in, but really doesn't do a ton. You know, they get some big creatures in some weird situations, but oftentimes Walking Bliss is just dealing one damage at a time, so Deflecting Palm doesn't really particularly stop what's going on there. And then the rest of the cards, you know, Core Firewalkers for the Red Mirrors, Rest in Peace, or whatever Graveyard Hate you're running tends to be for other decks. You know, the Heliod deck doesn't even tend to run Eternal Witness or anything, so it's not even particularly good there. Smash the Smithereens, primarily there for Chalice and such. So, you know, a lot of different cards in your sideboard only really path in your anti-life gain, anti-creature measures. So how many paths are many searing effects? You know, if you have any additional bold effects, whether it be, like, say, some people run Lightning Helixes in their sideboard, you know... Weird configurations you can come across with burn, but this is primarily something similar to what you'll see, you know, probably with burn the last six months, last four months, six months since Rolling Vortex has been printed. So, that said, let's get into the burn perspective with a couple of matches and see how burn handles the matchup. Taking a look at match number one, fortunately we lost the die roll. 
Uh, seems pretty reasonable. Uh, the one weakness with this particular hand in this particular matchup, we don't have any quick ways to deal with like a quick Arbor Elf or anything. But overall, we have Goblin Guide, Eidolon, which both are pretty relevant cards in the matchup early on. Skullcrack potentially stops some life gain for a turn, then Rift Bolt to, to deal with our opponent's creatures. Um, our opponent d did Mulligan to six. They lead on Arbor Elf. As I mentioned earlier, we have no way to deal with that, so they're going to get some quick mana. They reveal Basic Forest. Opponent does the thing. They play a quick Heliod here, so we're quickly in danger of being comboed, but you know we really can't do anything to break that up, especially with the Sorcery Speed Removal is the only card we have. And our opponent immediately plays Spike Feeder, and we can see, because this is the infinite life com the easiest infinite life combo they have in their deck, and just leads to us, uh, basically their life total getting ridiculously high, and we can't ever win the game. And then they can just kind of win at their leisure beyond that, because we eventually will run out of ways to kill our creatures, especially in game number one, and really have no hope of decking them specifically. So, kind of a rough start, but let's get into some sideboarding. Taking a look at sideboarding, looks like that we in the past we sideboarded out some Rift Bolts and some Boros Charms. So the thing with Rift Bolt is there's a twofold reason. One, it's the hardest one to time correctly to kill their creatures. Obviously, Skewer can also be awkward, but it also has the added disadvantage of when you're boarding in uh, the Vortexes, uh, you can't really afford to take the extra 5 damage. Well, their deck isn't really a beatdown deck. They do have some draws where they're capable of pressuring our life total, you know, with Oriok Champions or whatever, or they just have a better board presence than we do, and they're counterattacking us. Um, so sometimes you can't really afford to take 5 damage to cast your Rift Bolt on Suspend. And it's a little bit easier to trigger Skewer the Critics in the style of matchup than, say, something like Jun, where Jun's tearing apart your hand and forcing you to, uh, you know, dealing with your creatures. So, Boros Charms as well come out, and then we board in, like, our anti-life gain, anti-things. So we brought in the three pass, brought in the two vortexes, the one skull crack, and then the two various steering effects that were available. So, lots of stuff to bring in this matchup. Actually, a little bit more than I've been running recently against creature decks. Uh, this hand's excellent. Uh, we have one drop creature in the Searing Malaise, which is one of our best starts in this matchup. A whole bunch of other spells, if our opponent just does, like, plays a Utopia Sprawl or one, we can just literally go, like, Bolt Spike or, you know, Spike Skewer and get in a bunch of damage before our opponent establishes a board presence. You know, a little bit tricky with the Searing Blaze effect, um, not having a fetch land to be able to time it during our opponent's turn, but if, it, if they were to have jammed, um... Like at Arbor Elf here, Searing Blaze would be like the perfect play. Uh, here, we just kind of do the Spike Skewer play that we were talking about. Put our opponent to 10. You know, obviously one of Burn's best starts. Opponent plays Conclave Mentor, which kind of sucks. Um, specifically because, you know, they gain two life whenever it dies. Um, we could do a couple of things here. We could play Roiling Vortex. We could play Searing Blaze. Uh, we could play Searing Blaze plus Bolt. Um, that puts them to 7, 4, and they're 1 short. I don't know how I played this out in the past. Looks like I go with Blaze, and then do I play Bolt or not? Looks like I choose to hold Bolt to answer another creature, potentially. Uh, they just play Heliod here. We shock in, play Vortex, Bolt them, put them to 1, and then Vortex kills them, even if they had some instant speed way like Weather the Storm. To gain life, we have Roiling Vortex here to prevent that. So, you know, like I mentioned in our discussion of that opening hand, you know, that is one of Burns' like absolute premium draws against any type of creature deck. You know, being able to keep their creatures off the board while pressuring them is often very important. So, in a lot of ways, we kind of are kind of our best draws involve like being almost like a Delver or a Jun deck. You know, where you play your threat and just you know answer, 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 kill them. You know, so kind of a tempo-ish play, kind of our best bet, and that gets kind of a matchup. And as you see, you know, we barely had enough resources to cross the finish line, even with our opponent just gaining two life and um, um, us having one of our absolute best draws. So let's go on to the deciding game number three. Look at sideboarding, we didn't make any changes. Um, keeping the same, keeping the same uh, eight cards in, eight cards out. Uh, this hand. Also very good, not quite as good as the other one. Um, being on the draw is a little bit tricky too because you're never sure 
like how quickly you're going to need to answer things. Uh, Bolt on one could potentially answer. Um, Arbor Elf, Path Exile is pretty good against Oriok Champion. So overall, pretty good hand. Our opponent did mulligan to six again. They have Utopia Sprawl again. So opponent is constantly uh, not presenting us with a target for a Bolt turn one. They have a Scavenging Ooze, which could be a little bit tricky. Play the Ooze. Um, we play that. Play Swiss Spear, we Bolt the Ooze just to get out of the way, because otherwise it could be problematic. Uh, opponent passes here, which likely reads as Collected Company. Still attack in here. Nothing? Okay, they collect a company at the end of turn, it looks like. They put in. Um, hmm. Looks like the game might have glitched with Collected Company here. I hope not. But the ending result of this match is we won, so I'm curious what happened here. Collected company, collected company, path to exile. Looks like we're in pretty good shape to end the game, but unfortunately we don't get to see the kind of the end result here. I'm not sure if this was a concession in this collected company here or what went on, but kind of disappointing to not see the ending. But uh, we did get the win here. Like I said, we were kind of playing the tempo game here. We have a couple of skull cracks here to prevent them from gaining life. Path to Exile to break up any type of combo shenanigans. So we were looking in a pretty good spot here. Um, just kind of proving that Burn can win the matchup, although it's certainly not favorable. But we do have one more match from the Burn perspective of this particular matchup. Taking a look at the second match, we're on the play this time. Opening hand is an interesting one. Um... So this is a hand, especially on the play, it's got four lands, which is not ideal, but Goblin Guide and a Blaze in this particular matchup is very interesting to me. So I'm not sure if I kept this one in the past or not. This was a hand that would certainly be borderline. Certainly could see keeping it, certainly could see mulliganing it. Looks like we mulliganed. Uh, this hand... It's still decent. We have less lands, obviously. Um, plenty of creatures to pressure our opponent. Probably putting back Lava Spike here would be my guess. Yeah, doesn't answer any of their creatures. Which is at a premium in this kind of matchup. Goblin Guide reveals Tumble Garden. And it does the thing. They play Tumble Garden into Arbor Elf. Fortunately, we have no way of answering that, so we just play Eidolon here. Uh, they show us Collected Company. Obviously, that other hand would have had a Searing Blaze, which would have been nice. When it goes Heliod, we do the thing, we do the thing, we just pressure them as best we can. Our opponent has the combo, so even though we had an excellent start, get them to three, we just die to the Infinite Life combo here. Uh, with Double Skewer the Critics, there's really not a whole lot we could do. Um, ironically, the other hand would have been better at pressuring our opponent, or not as good at pressuring our opponent, but would have killed the Arbor Elf and would have been a little bit better. Uh, one other play we to potentially have done here would have been to uh, Swiss Spear plus Skewer the Critics to kill the Arbor Elf, but they already had enough lands. They would have been able to cast Spike Feeder and they would have been at two instead. Um, if I would have cast skewer would they have been dead so five damage may have actually screwed up my sequencing here so last turn we attacked with for two four six six damage so it'd be a five they were at 11 11 minus two four six nine Yeah, if we would have cast Skewer the Critics on their face, would they have just been dead? Um, two, four, six, nine damage. Okay, so five damage before they cast this. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 
So if we were attacked for two, four, six, nine, eleven, yeah, they would have actually been exactly dead if I would have cast skewer the critics on their face. Um, however, we did know about the two copies of Collected Company, so they wouldn't have just had to jam Spike Feeder. They could have cast Collected Company, and they would still have been at one with having to fetch for a land here, um, which they definitely run basic forests in their decks. They'd be able to go to one. Potentially hit Spike Feeder, so if we would have cast Skewer the Critics, maybe we would have had a better chance, because they would have been at two instead of five. Um, but... Yeah, different lines of play we could have taken in the end result. I still think our opponent was decently favored to find something there to gain some life. Maybe hold on for another turn or two. But, you know, just dying to the infinite life combo. Maybe we should have cast but Skewer the Critics instead of the second Swiss Beer there. Always good to look at additional play lines in these, in these replays sometimes. But, anyways, on to sideboard. Speaking of sideboarding. Looks like we did the same thing as we did last time, bringing the past, the two searing effects, the in, the vortexes, and the skull crack. Uh, boarded out Boros charms and Rift bolts. Once again, for much the same reason, Rift bolts can be a little bit slow as removal. Plus the fact that uh, you know it's a little bit awkward with vortex in play. This hand is a very mediocre hand, and it's probably a mulligan. You can answer the first creature. We have a skull crack, but we have four lands. No real way to pressure our opponent. This hand also is kind of very meh. I think we end up mulliganing this hand. Um, this hand is potentially very good. Our opponent is also mulliganing quite a bit. So we're not quite in as bad shape here. Uh, as far as this hand, um, we definitely want Swiss Spear. Definitely want Vortex. Is it Blaze? Put back a land in a bowl? Or blood, put back a land and a bolt. Put back a land and put back a bolt. Obviously a little bit awkward. Sometimes searing blood doesn't kill every creature we want to kill. And we draw a bolt anyway, which was nice. Get to drop a whirling vortex. Our opponent doesn't have a one drop for one game. Um, we're pressuring our opponent here, which is quite nice. They seem to have had a slow hand. There's a Heliod. They're still not presenting us any creatures. Looks like they have a collected company here, potentially. So they decide to cast during combat, which is a little bit weird, but once again, looks like our collected company is gonna bug things out. But you can definitely see how with a searing effect and um, this uh, preventing life gain that they could win the game. Looks like these collected companies are causing these replays to bug out. But, you know, searing blood into whatever they're playing here, um, we have a way to stop the infinite combo, both through damage and through Roiling Vortex itself. And blood here would put them to, would force them to block with the other creature, and then would put them to one, because this would kill the creature, most creatures in their deck, and then put them to one, and then Roiling Vortex would finish them off. So, you know, these Horizon lands sometimes aren't free in the aggressive matchups. You know, we know that from the burn perspective. But it's just a friendly reminder that sometimes from the uh, other pers other decks' perspective, like these Horizon lands, which they're quite nice in attrition matchups, you know, and sometimes these burn versus whatever matchups can become attrition-y, so they're quite nice. But when your life total is under a huge amount of duress, the, these one life, you know, chunking away at a time can certainly hurt. But anyways, let's get in the final game and see if burn can't steal two wins against what's a relatively difficult matchup. Once again, nothing's really changed with sideboarding, so let's get into the match, shall we? Uh, sand, one lander, only really a bolt to interact, things a mulligan. I agree with my past self, this hand is quite good. Swiss spear into any type of blaze effect, backed up by a skull crack, probably put back one of the lands. Which I would guess, yeah, that made sense. Opponent once again with no turn one play. We have a turn one pressure play. Opponent's deck. Okay, they have Conclave Mentor here. We just blaze the first target they present us. Offset some of the life total. They should be at 13 if they hadn't had Conclave Mentor. We have Helion, which we can't really interact with, which put them to 13. Once again, having to hold up Skullcrack more than anything. 
do this. Can't really cast any of our spells. They path. So a spear. It looks like they kept a very reactive hand. Um, did they mulligan this game? Yeah, they mulligan the six as well. So they kept a bit of a sketchy hand, it looks like. You just continue to pressure them. You have an Eldamari's call. They go for Oriok Champion. It's an interesting one to Eldamari's call for. I guess they figured we had an answer to the combo, but we're able to answer that because of path. Then we unload and kill them at the end of turn. So. Very interesting set of draws. Um, we did get helped out a little bit there by it looks like our opponent had um, a bit of an iffy keep there on six, but you know, kind of hard to argue Conclave Mentor into Heliod, especially with them on the play. So, you know, that is a very powerful combo. You know, them drawing the Eldamari's call, maybe they're supposed to go for Spike Feeder there, put us at a little bit of a standoff. But we had more than enough creatures or more than enough cards to answer it with skull crack backups that was quite nice so whatever they Eldamari's called for we would pretty much have been able to answer it barring something that had protection from white and red which to my knowledge the only creature of magic that has protection from white and red is Phyrexian Crusader and I highly doubt the green white decks playing Phyrexian Crusader um, beyond that you know this is a very tricky matchup um, you know I could do you know, a quick wrap up from the deck tech stand or from the deck tech standpoint, but the main thing is one drop creature in the blaze effect or bolt your first whatever play into Eidolon. Those seem to be the best overall plays. I mean, that said, they do have a lot of almost much answer creatures, Oriok Champion, um, Spike Feeder when Heliod's in play, Walking Blister when Heliod's in play. Um, you know, Cap Ranger Captain's quite annoying to play against. Uh, Giver of Runes, which some lists run one or two of to be able to go fetch with Ranger Captain. You know, there's a lot of layers to this matchup. Um, but once again, our best starts are one drop into a Blaze effect. Whether that be Searing Blaze, Searing Blood. Um, or, you know, one drop into one drop plus Bolt. You know, a lot of our, like, ideal burn draws are very ideal in this matchup. Most of their creatures are vulnerable to Bolts. Or path to exile, um, so you know we can really leverage most of our tools quite well in this matchup. That said, they do have an equal number, if not greater, number of tools that are equally good against us. So overall, I do think this matchup is a little bit of a dog. Um, the one thing that we are able to leverage better is we have much more uh, reliability of our one mana plays, and a good bit of their best plays are three mana and above. You know, Heliod, Spike Feeder, Collected Company, Ranger Captain. Most of them require three mana. And, you know, they are still whatever version you're running against, whether it's a mana dork version. Um, there's been an update, updates to the Heliod lists lately. You know, they've been playing Skyclave Apparitions more. They've been running um, copies of Archangel of Thune as an additional combo with Spike Feeder. Uh, so, like I said, I don't think it would greatly change the dynamic of these matches as these matches were, were recorded or were played a couple months ago but so i didn't think it, it adjusted the recording that much that i needed to go back and record different matches but you know the, the thing still remains is you know you're you are very much the aggressor they are the control deck in the matchup you need to get them dead while managing their creatures long enough to not get infinite comboed whether that be them gaining infinite life you getting infinite damage and they also do um some amount of you know sometimes counter racing with like you know just random creature beat downs so you know interesting matchup wanted to give you a look from the other perspective from the burn perspective as we'd already looked from the heliod perspective so hopefully this gives you a better idea how to approach the matchup from the burn side and if you're a heliod player and see this for the first time hope it gives you a little bit better idea of what a burn perspective in this style of matchup is that's it this is John for MTG Nexus. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this kind of type of content. And hope to see you in the next video.